So this summer you're going to be getting nothing but negative reviews because I hate summertime, I hate the heat, and it is starting to affect me um, in ways that I can't even explain to you. The Anbrenic RG353P has been out for a little while, and it's been a device that has gotten a lot of positive reception. Now, I've been spending a lot of time playing games on my unit, and I just don't really agree with some of what I've heard. This isn't a bad device by all means, but there are two things that keep this device from being at the top for me. Those being the competition and the price of this unit. So, introducing the RG353P from Anbrenic. Hear me out, and let's dive right on. The exterior design consists of plastic for the entirety of the build. As you can see, this device is shaped just like an SNES controller, but it is a lot larger than one. It's genuinely surprising how big this device is, and I certainly would not consider it pocketable. But for usability, I do like the size because this device is actually rather comfortable to game on. You will find the grips around the back, and I personally have always liked to see these on Ambernix devices. This device, it feels pretty well built. It feels pretty strong, and I think that it looks pretty cool, which is kind of important. On the front, you're going to find your usual set of buttons. These buttons look pretty small in retrospect, and while I would have preferred if they were larger, since we do have enough real estate to facilitate that, these buttons feel perfectly fine in practice. The thumbsticks, however, feel pretty loose and pretty slick on the top, and I really don't like how they feel. I would have liked to see a little more resistance on that. On the top, you're going to find your shoulder buttons, which are stacked and harder to press on, but I do like how they feel. You will also find two USB-C ports, a reset button, a mini HDMI button, and a volume rocker. On the bottom, you're going to find your serial speakers, dual micro SD card slots, and a headphone jack. Overall, I think that this is a nicely built device, for the exception of the analog sticks, which kind of suck. This device features a 3.5 640x480 IPS display. This display is pretty nice, actually. It's colorful enough, gets bright enough, and most games will look pretty on this device. Granted, this is a 4x3 screen, which will bode pretty well for just about every emulator that you will be playing on this device, except for maybe PSP. This does kind of suck for me since I do prefer to have a 16x9 display for this reason, but I understand that most people would rather have this aspect ratio. But yes, this is a pretty good display and it's such an able to, to allow for better navigation within Android, which is always going to be an important thing to have too. So like I mentioned earlier, this device features stereo speakers which are bottom firing. In spite of how they face the bottom, they still sound pretty good. They get reasonably loud, and I enjoy gaming with these, no problem. So, have a listen. Now this unit features an RK3566 CPU, 2GB of RAM, comes with 32GB of built-in storage with options for 16GB micro SD card and up that come loaded with a Linux skin. This device also comes with a 3500mAh battery. As you can see, the specs are almost identical to the RG503, but it comes with more RAM which is what makes Android usable, and having Android is kind of a big deal here. So for this review, I decided to only stick to Android because if I have the option, I will only use Android. With this OS, you should be able to take greater advantage of the hardware on this device. But to people who don't really want to do much tinkering and just want it to work out of the box, then you should just stick to the Linux OS as it offers a just much more streamlined interface that's pretty easy to use. Just keep the included SD card inside for the first SD card slot and you don't have to worry about it. Uh, but if you're like me and you want to stick with Android, know that you do get Android 11 with this device, which is really good. This means that there is greater compatibility with emulators like Aether SX2, and you do get a bunch of emulators included with your purchase as well, such as Aether SX2, Dolphin, Drastic, Duck Station, GBA.MU, M64 Plus FZ Pro, PPSS PP, and you even get RetroArch on there as well. So yeah, you do get quite a good selection by default. But besides that, Android is very empty here. My unit did not even come with the Play Store installed, and I haven't been able to figure out how to get it on there otherwise. This is kind of a big deal, as I could have 
downloaded some other emulators directly, like Redream for example. So you will be stuck with the default apps included with this product. It's not like how it is on the RG552 where you do get a bunch of apps and now you do even get the Play Store with it. So you could do so much more with it. You can customize it a lot more. You just don't get that with the RG353P. Now let's go ahead and talk about performance. Let's begin by talking about how the RG353P performs in SNES while using the SNES 9X EX Plus emulator. I hate these names. Performance is practically flawless with the setup. I didn't do anything in particular to get it to run this well, as games like A Link to the Past just run very well here. It also helps here that, I mean, the RG353P is shaped just like an SNES controller, but it's way bigger, but still, it is shaped just like one. So it just happens to fit so well with this. Like, I feel like it's just a really good device for SNES in particular. And as I keep saying, it just really adds to this level of authenticity that you could possibly only get out of the Pocket Go S30, I think it's called. It's really cool. And the fact that it does generally feel like I'm holding a portable SNES is a really sweet feeling. Everything just falls really nicely into place, and I absolutely love that. SNES is also a very easy system to emulate in general, so performance will almost never be an issue at all for a device like this one, so have your fun. N64 through the M64 Plus FZ Pro emulator. Performance here is going to be really good here too, which is always great to see. I remember that the RG503 with the same CPU but half of the RAM and running on Linux instead could barely run N64 at all since it had so many performance issues. But that changes with the RG353P as you get pretty smooth gameplay overall in something like Super Mario 64 and Ocarina of Time. It's very enjoyable, though you will still come across some severe texture pop in here and there. This isn't something that really bothers me too much, but it's something that could still bother plenty of people. The pop-in mostly happens in games like Mario 64, but this doesn't really bother me, if at all. However, the looseness of the thumbsticks here do feel kind of counterintuitive, and the texture is a bit too slick, so this does get in the way of the gaming experience when maybe you're not expecting that from other aspects of this device. So great performance, but would have liked better hardware controls here, and a lot less texture popping, I suppose. Now let's get into PlayStation 1 performance through the DuckStation emulator. Performance here is also very good. I tested out games like Mortal Kombat 4 and Final Fantasy Tactics, and got really good performance from both of these. You will mostly be using the face buttons and not the analog stick, so PlayStation 1 is actually really fun to play on this device. So far, the lower end systems have been very solid to play on this device, and I am happier than I have been with any other retro system gaming on this one. And seriously, the performance has been on point so far, and the buttons have been really good to use too, except for the analog sticks. So yeah, so far so good. But it is when we go as far as PSP that we start to see some issues. PSP through the PPS's PP emulator runs mostly fine. Games are certainly playable, but you will start to see a lot of the same issues that you come across on Linux here too. For example, something as simple as Final Fantasy IV will still show plenty of signs of stuttering. For example, during combat and even in the menu selection in the overworld, this is a turn-based game. This is rather unacceptable because this device should at least show decent strides in PSP in comparison to the previous RK3326 chip. This will also be shown in other games like Dissidia, Final Fantasy, but most of the stutters have to do with the audio for this game in particular. And with something like Naruto Ultimate Ninja Heroes 2, you don't get as many stutters, but they are still present. Not to mention that because of the aspect ratio of this display, you're just not getting the best experience. But besides the visuals, I would consider the performance to be the most concerning thing here. I still think that PSP is totally playable, but these issues should not be around at this stage. Now, when it comes to GameCube through the Dolphin MMJR emulator that you can sideload through Chrome, you still get very poor performance. I decided to test out a game like Dragon Ball Budokai 2 since it isn't very demanding and I don't expect a system like this to suddenly be able to handle GameCube, but I'm curious to see what it can manage. While the RP2 Plus can run some GameCube games which are totally playable, won't be the case for every single game, of course, but I would hope that this $40 more expensive device can manage something a little similar. And GameCube barely runs at all on the RG353P. Performance with Budokai 2 is pretty terrible. Not even the opening cinematic runs at a full speed. Everything runs in probably half of the frame rate and it just feels extremely slow and sluggish. 
Even with the superior version of Dolphin while it runs on Android on the Vulkan API, it simply cannot work any miracles here. You should not get the system for GameCube, and never mind Wii. Now, the performance of PlayStation 2 games on the Aether SX2 emulator is a little bit worse. This I would definitely consider to be borderline impossible to get through. Kingdom Hearts 2 barely runs at all, and it runs at a very low frame rate. It is like playing this game in ultra slow motion. It's not doable, it's just not manageable. So do not get your hopes up for either GameCube or PlayStation 2 on the system, because I don't see a future where either one of these will actually be decently playable on the RG 353P. You should get the system for great PlayStation 1 and below emulation. And hell, you can even do game streaming on the system, which is really cool, and you have access to RetroArch if you want that. It's a very powerful tool, I just don't like to use it personally. Now let's go ahead and talk about HDMI output, because this device has a mini HDMI port. You can plug it into your TV or monitor and play that way while using this device itself as the controller. And while the Android interface looks terrible and super blurry, you do at least get to enjoy some good gameplay, depending on what you're playing. And yes, the image will stretch to a 16 by 9 aspect ratio, so it will try to fill out the entire screen, even if you're playing a 4x3 game. I do prefer this, but I can see how plenty of people who always want a 4x3 look would much rather that stay consistent, no matter what. So yeah, like that's just going to depend on what, what kind of person you are. So, after all of this, here is the point that I'm trying to make. The Retro Pocket 2 Plus exists, and is just a better value system overall. I say this because it's cheaper and is a stronger performer than the RG353P. Allow me to elaborate. So the Retro Pocket 2 Plus has more solid buttons in my opinion with less flimsy thumbsticks. The caps are the same but they don't really feel the same to me. But you do miss out on L3 and R3 functionality. Also the right stick is a digital stick which doesn't really feel very good. But you do get the Play Store by default and you can download whatever emulators you want from it. For example. I can't play Dreamcast on the RG 353P with the ReDream emulator unless maybe I go through RetroArch, but like I said, I really don't like using RetroArch at all. So I hate that that option has just been stripped away from me. And you really can't even download one either since it doesn't come with the Play Store. So if there are any emulators missing, then you might be SOL there. Lastly, there are performance differences and the RP2 Plus is a stronger performer than the RG 353P. When it comes to the lower end systems, these two will be very similar in terms of performance, but it's when we test out PlayStation Portable that we start to see a difference and above other systems moving up from there. So PSP does run better on the RP2 Plus as there is less stuttering, especially in some of the more mundane places such as entering the save menu in Final Fantasy IV. These are stutters and frame dips that are present on the RG353P and to some extent in every PSP game that I tested there. When it comes to GameCube, the differences are night and day. I would consider a decent amount of GameCube games to be at least playable on the RP2 Plus, but none of the games that I tested really function properly on the RG 353P. For example, a relatively simple game to run is, is well, Dragon Ball Budokai 2. And on the RG 353P, this game chugs beyond what is acceptable. This game is completely unplayable. But on the RP2 Plus, runs this game just fine and is totally playable, even if not that comfortable to play because of the controls, but it still runs pretty well. Now, something like Twilight Princess does still struggle to run a bit on the RP2 Plus, but I would consider it playable, sort of playable at least, on the RP2 Plus, when the RG 353P is going to run this game much more poorly. PS2 is pretty bad on both systems, so I won't really rag on the RG 353P much here, but I think that I've made my point. The Retro Pocket 2 Plus is very strong competition, almost unfair competition, I would say. And lastly, the battery life on this system is actually pretty good since it has a pretty large battery. I've been getting around four hours of battery life, which is actually really good considering that a lot of retro handouts that I test tend to run at around three hours. So in conclusion, my point with all of this here is that I honestly don't understand all of the almost overwhelmingly positive reception. I'm also not trying to rag on it on purpose, but I kind of feel like the RG 353P has been put on the pedestal that it doesn't really deserve to be put put on, mostly because the RP2 Plus exists. The RG 353P is a pretty cool device, no doubt, but it does seem overpriced for what it offers as it retails for around $140, but it's a weaker performer than the $100 Retro Pocket 2 Plus that released earlier this year. 
The chipset is underwhelming, performance is underwhelming, the lack of a Play Store is underwhelming, etc. I just can't in good conscience recommend the RG 353P when the RP2 Plus exists because I believe that it is the superior product for considerably less. I think that Ambernick is still pricing themselves out of the competition to the point where it doesn't really make much sense to get a lot of their products nowadays, especially compared to the rest of the competition. Now, I do hope that Ambernick becomes more competitive as they used to be because at this time they have been releasing half baked, overpriced products like the Win 600, the RG552, the RG503, and more recently the RG353P. So no, I don't recommend it, and if you wanted a system like this one, I would probably urge you to get the Retroid Pocket 2 Plus, or the RP2 Plus as I've been calling it, instead. So thank you so much for watching this video all the way up until the very end, it is always very much appreciated. And I would also love to give a very special thanks to all of our patrons, beginning with the Tier 3's Omar Thron still at the end of the month, uh, keep that in mind. Uh, so please continue to enjoy the perks that have been coming along. And uh, yeah, I look forward to another chapter moving forward from that. Also, please make sure to follow me on Instagram where I do posts every now and then and on Twitch where I do, in fact, stream on schedule. <laughs> now, with that said, this has been Francisco from Tech Summit. Thank you for watching and until next time, enjoy.